When the Chinese government loosened up its strict housing regulations in the 90s, this regulation change sparked a massive housing bubble in China. Western home improvement companies Home Depot and IKEA saw this as their big ticket into the blossoming Chinese market. While IKEA hit a home run and still thrives today in China, the same couldn't be said for Home Depot. They lasted only a few short years before they were forced to close down and head back west. How did IKEA succeed in China, while Home Depot never stood a chance? Contrary to their Chinese debacle, Home Depot is thriving in the West. They have over 2,200 North American stores and a market cap of $359 billion as of 2021. They build their success on their massive retail stores. Big box stores break down into two categories, general and specialty. General big box stores include Target and Walmart, where consumers can buy just about anything. Specialty stores such as Best Buy, or in this case Home Depot, sell specialized items. Founded in 1978 in Atlanta, Georgia, Home Depot's pioneers set out to build the largest home improvement store the country had ever seen. Home Depot's first two stores opened up on lots that were leased out to them by J.C. Penney in 1979. Each store had over 250,000 pieces of inventory. The first ads ran were all about the sheer size of the selection in the stores. In a strange marketing gimmick, the owners sent employees and even sent their kids into the parking lot with dollar bills to hand out. Approach anyone they see, hand them a bill, and invite them to come spend a dollar at the new Home Depot stores. The idea was simple, but ineffective. Even though they struggled early, two years later, Home Depot went public on Nasdaq, raising over $4 million. They joined the New York Stock Exchange in 1984. With a new infusion of cash, Home Depot continued expanding, opening stores in Florida and Texas. However, the Texas expansion didn't come without a hefty price tag. To open up in Dallas, Home Depot had to buy Bowater Home Center for $40 million. By expanding too quickly, Home Depot's debt ballooned to over $200 million. In 1986, Home Depot pumped the brakes on its expansion to restructure its debt and upgrade its management system. It took just a few years to get back on track, and by 1989, Home Depot surpassed Lowe's to become the biggest home repair store in the US. With 100 big box stores operating by 1990, Home Depot decided it was time to expand internationally. In 1994, Home Depot spent $150 million for 75% share of a Canadian hardware store chain called Aikenhead's Home Improvement Warehouse. Plans for expansion into Mexico existed, but those were put on hold until the Canadian deal was reworked and finished. As the year 2000 approached, Home Depot set its sights on another massive expansion, this time on the other side of the world, China. China has had a long history of political regimes and practices. Today, the country is still run by the Communist Party of China, or the CCP as it's more commonly known. In 1978, China saw a period of massive economic reform as it opened its previously closed market to the outside world. Trade between countries, particularly China and the West, sent China's economy through the roof, giving rise to a brand new generation of new money known as the Nouveau Riche. The housing market in China had been reliant on a socialist housing system that linked housing with employment units. The government owned all the land and occupants paid heavily subsidized rent. In 1978, housing was finally allowed to be controlled by the private sector. As a result, the average floor space per family quadrupled between 1978 and 2007, going from 6.7 square meters to 28.3 square meters. More floor space meant more furniture. While individual homes were getting bigger and the power was put in the hands of the people, the government technically still owned all the land. In China, citizens get the right to use the land residentially for a lease term of 70 years. This means that Chinese citizens have the rights to the property, but they technically don't own it outright. But Chinese citizens still refer to these technical leases as home ownership. Without the private ownership of land, the market for large-scale home improvement projects shrinks. Furthermore, the close proximity of homes in dense areas of China didn't allow much space for home improvement projects. Even though Home Depot did market research, they didn't do enough cultural research. They saw a booming economy and a privatized housing market, but that didn't mean they understood how to do business in China. Home Depot's first step into China was buying a company called Homeway, a Chinese home improvement 
improvement chain in 2006. Homeway had 12 stores in the country. All of them adopted the Home Depot rebranding and received typical Home Depot inventory. IKEA, on the other hand, got an early jump on the Chinese market, whereas they opened their first store in Shanghai in 1998. For Home Depot, seven of their first 12 stores in China closed by 2012. By that time, the Chinese market only accounted for a minuscule 0.3% of its net sales. The move ultimately cost them $160 million. IKEA, on the other hand, is still thriving in China today. The rustic masculine appeal of a do-it-yourself home improvement store works completely well in Western culture. However, Home Depot failed to take several cultural factors into consideration when it moved into the Chinese market. Let's take a deeper examination at the DIY mindset that's to be expected out of Home Depot customers. It simply doesn't appeal to the vast majority of Chinese citizens because of the cheap available labor in China. DIY is also generally viewed as something only poor people do. While it's cheaper to do it yourself in America, labor cost in China is pennies on the dollar. Not only does this play into the social stigma of manual labor, but it adds to the socioeconomic divide in China. 30% of the Chinese workforce are lower to middle class, white collar workers workers making between $500 and $5,000 per month, taking the upper and upper middle class out of the equation, who equate to 5.2% of the Chinese population, were left with the lower class or grassroots class. They make up 60% of the population. These grassroots workers are the ones doing all the manual labor, with little hope of breaking through to the next level. They admire and respect the classes above them, but the reverse isn't true. People in the middle class simply won't do anything that could be seen as lower class. By the late 90s and early 2000s, the Chinese housing market was exploding. Even though housing demand was going up, what was going on behind the scenes made more sense as to why Home Depot couldn't last in China. The spike in real estate activity was attributed to people buying homes just to try to make some quick money. These flippers weren't furnishing the homes as if they were planning to live there. All they were doing was just speculating on the housing market continuing to go up simply with the demand going up. They didn't want to put in any new flooring, cabinets or large appliances. Basically, they simply didn't want to buy anything Home Depot was trying to sell them because they never planned on moving into these homes. Both housing and economic growth can be attributed to China's newly open market and doing business with the West. New money in China wanted to live like people in the West, but they simply didn't know how. This is especially true when it comes to furnishing their new homes. Back then, if the average first-time middle-class home-owning Chinese couple walks into Home Depot, they wouldn't be familiar with what goes into a home. They easily could be overwhelmed by all the tools, random fixtures, furnishings, and materials. Even though anything that could be in a Western home is most likely available in Home Depot, the average Chinese citizen wouldn't know what to buy to outfit their home in a Western style. However, if that same couple walks into IKEA, suddenly everything changes. They see inspiration from entire rooms put together in the Western style they want. IKEA tells them exactly how to set up the rooms in their new home. All they have to do is buy the furniture and offer to put it together for them. Being able to create a desire for things their customers didn't know they needed gave IKEA a massive edge in selling in the Chinese market. The vast majority of first-generation Chinese homeowners also went living in massive homes. They simply didn't have the space for tools and hardware in order to put together big projects. In the West, Home Depot caters to men. When it comes to home improvement, men are in the majority as decision makers in the purchase process. However, However, in China, the flip is true. Instead, anything pertaining to furnishing the home, the decision maker is primarily a woman. Home Depot didn't seem to consider the purchasing power of Chinese women before losing $160 million in the Chinese market. From 1979 to 2015, China operated on a one-child-per-family policy to control the growing population. In 2015, the law changed to two children. However, the ratio of men to women skewed as Chinese parents preferred boys to girls through the 80s and 90s. There are 120 Chinese men for every 100 Chinese women, leaving 30 million surplus men in desperate search of a wife. Because wives are hard to come by in China, men in general will defer to their wives on many decisions.
decisions in general. This is especially true when it comes to furnishing a home. With Chinese women doing all the shopping, Home Depot's allure of Western masculinity simply didn't work. Instead of ending up in Home Depot, many Chinese women wound up in IKEA pop-up shops on street corners and in malls. Chinese consumers and women in general simply didn't want to see the materials to create the space they desired. Instead, they wanted to see the finished products in a created vision, so their decision-making was much easier. Whereas Home Depot had rock bottom in China, IKEA is thriving to this day. As of 2021, IKEA has 35 stores operating in China. That's its third biggest footprint in a country, right behind Germany with 54 stores and the US with 52. IKEA did everything right with a Chinese expansion. Whether by luck or design, their store design simply aligned with what Chinese citizens needed and wanted in order to decorate their homes in a Western style. Fully modeled bedrooms, dining rooms, and kitchens showed first-time Chinese homeowners how to furnish their homes to live like Europeans and Americans. The matching furnishes and stylish design appealed to young couples, and most importantly, it appealed to women. But IKEA's in China didn't go without hiccups. Customers would routinely sleep on display furniture in stores. This is understandable as afternoon naps are a common habit in China. In order to deal with the media reports, IKEA announced that they had no intention to stop their potential customers from sleeping on display furniture. They didn't see it as a problem at all. Instead, they were happy to see that consumers thought IKEA was like their home. Their rationale was that the more customers that fell asleep and hung out at the display rooms, the more they were likely to purchase. Chinese IKEAs aren't that different from other IKEAs in the US. The business model is mostly the same. Make customers walk through the maze of different room designs and then let people go pick up what they want. They still serve their classic Swedish dishes in their cafeterias, such as their famous meatballs and gravy, giving Chinese buyers another taste of Western life. However, they were also smart enough to localize their menu and offer traditional Chinese food options such as dim sum and hot pot. Click to watch one of these next videos.